Good morning and welcome to Nature Watch. Nature Watch is sponsored by Waddell's Nursery Floral Garden and Bird Center. Actually, it's two weeks if I do the math. Two weeks. Yeah, three weeks. I'm an English major. Well, no, this is this, this is, is the oh, third. this is the third. It is. Yes. Whoa, I had it right the first time. Maybe I should just <laughs> shut up. Nature Watch brought to you by Waddell's Nursery Floral Garden and Bird Center at the corner of Milliman 12th Street, right there in the roundabout. Now here he is, your host for Nature Watch, the one, the only, the inimitable, Gary Miller. How are you, sir? Good. Good morning. A little frosty out there this morning. A little bit, but that's okay. Yeah, it's, that, uh, it's been nice, you know, and it's going to get nicer if you look at the extended outlook. Yeah, the extended outlook looks like it's going to be uh, quite warm. You know, what scares me, I guess, and this would be a question I would ask uh, uh, Andy if you were here, are, are, the, are trees and flowers that come up in the springtime, are they in danger when we have that kind of oh, yes, extended yes. period? Yeah. You know, you're going to start seeing things that you're not supposed just, to you know, see. Native, native plants out there, everything in this unusually warm weather, mm-hmm. they start thinking, oh, spring's right around the corner. Yeah. We're going to start getting those buds to swell, start getting bigger. <laughs> and then we get that really cold, cold snap in March or April. And that's when we get a lot of that frost damage on a lot of those plants. Yeah, and, it's, it's uh, just scary, especially it's, it's, with it's the fruit not good crop. For plants. Um, fruit crop them out a lot. everything else because I, I it's happened before. And I mean, you know, this is not something that's brand new. We've had it before. No. They, they've survived, but it's still uh, yeah. it, it stresses those plants somewhat. So it's so, uh, well. Welcome back. Uh, yes, we were here last week, but you were uh, we yeah, were I was, I was in technology. Our, I was in the remote uh, location down in Orange Beach, Alabama, and. Uh, that uh, remote, uh, it worked out pretty well. We had a few little glitches, a couple little uh, gaps or so. Um, I think maybe it might have been, this is my theory, uh, maybe there was a couple spots in the uh, interlink between Alabama and here that uh, somebody didn't have the string pulled taut enough between the cans. We're or just going to so. have to get better string. That's yeah. all there is to so, it. Yeah. But it worked out pretty well. Cool. Uh, so, and, and uh, I, I guess I could have stayed here for a couple of days. I saw the same fog that you saw up here. <laughs> uh, it was warmer, Alabama though. It was fog. nice being warmer. Alabama fog is the same as Michigan fog, apparently. Oh, gosh, so, yeah. Well, that's all right. So, well, well, welcome back. So it's uh, good to be back. Um, a, a little bit about uh, yesterday was Groundhog Day, and uh, I'll talk about uh, we've, we've talked about groundhogs in the past a little bit because they're in that squirrel family, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about groundhogs. But Groundhog Day yesterday um, in Gabbler's Knob, Pennsylvania, Punx- Punxsutawney Phil did not see his shadow. So he is predicting an early spring for only the 21st time in 138 years. Wow. Phil did not see his shadow. He saw his shadow 107 of those times, and they also have records missing for 10 years. So there's 10 years they don't know what he predicted. And uh, I thought it was interesting. I'm going to read his, his official proclamation was, Another winter slumber pause so I could meet the crowd. Hard to sleep anyway when the party's this loud. I envy your energy. I envy the fun. I envy all of you and your opposable thumbs. But it's not what I feel, it's what I see and what you hear. So gather around and let me be clear. Atmosphere is a wonderful thing, and we can create our own and the weather it brings. It brings hope for the future and so much more. Maybe some Punxsutawney Phil write in votes in 2024. But one thing the weather did not provide is a shadow and a reason to hide. Glad tidings on this Groundhog Day and early spring is on the way. All right. So according to Punxsutawney Phil, who has only been correct not quite 40% of the time, we're going to have an early spring. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of the other critters that are maybe some competition for Punxsutawney Phil here a little later in the show. You know, I've always wondered, Gary, do they draw straws to see what idiot sticks his hands inside that thing to an animal that's got very <laughs> sharp teeth? Well, well and it, Does anybody ever get bit? Oh, yeah. They've, they've gotten bit in the past. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, too. Oh, okay. Some of those competitors right. who've had some incidents in the years past. Uh-huh. So, okay. Um, but, yeah, it, the, the groundhogs don't like to be handled. Um, they're in hibernation. They go in a deep hibernation. And uh, that's why Phil always looks so lethargic when they pull him out of his, his den there. Um, it's like he's in his wind winter sleep and they've disturbed him. <laughs> so... At, uh, it's interesting to see. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the groundhogs then. Uh, a couple of events coming up. Uh, I don't want to talk about events here. Um, Waddell's Green Thumb Club Series is still continuing. And uh, today they have uh, a couple of them uh, on house plants and succulents. So something interesting to do. Next week, uh, we've got two of them that would be interested to you nature folks. Um, one of them is using native plants in your landscape to attract birds. And another one using rocks in your landscape. 
and everybody runs across rocks and sometimes don't know what to do with them. So there's actually some neat things you can do with rock in your landscape. And then there's several others uh, coming up after in, in subsequent weeks. Uh, but uh, you know, check out Waddell's.com, go to their events, and uh, you can see all the different events, sign up for those. I know a lot of those seminars are full or near full. Um, they will be offered again, most of them, or if not all of them, um, at our Spring Expo. And that's that fourth weekend in March. Uh, March is a little messed up month-wise, but uh, it's at uh, 23rd and 24th, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the uh, this uh, actually in a couple weeks, you're looking for something to do on Valentine's Day. And uh, want to treat your sweetie to, to something unique. Um, it's another Birds and Coffee online chat with Kellogg Bird Sanctuary. Um, it's 10 to 11 in the morning in, on February 14th. And they're going to be talking about how birds fall in love. So maybe something appropriate for uh, Valentine's Day. Um, it's a free event. It's online. You do need to register ahead of time so you can get the Zoom link. So something uh, neat to, to do. And uh, something else is coming up. We, we talked about the Christmas bird count, but right now we have uh, coming up the Great Backyard Bird Count. Yes. Uh, I, I participated in that before. It's fun. And uh, that, that's uh, the February 16th through the 19th. It's the 27th annual. Um, last year, they estimated half a million, more than half a million people participated. They reported more than 7,500 species of birds from 200 plus countries. So, really interesting, fun event. Um, you need can do it for any length of time as far as observing what birds you see, uh, but you need to do it for at least 15 minutes. That could be in your backyard, or in a park, a wilderness area, apartment balcony, or a neighborhood street. Um, if you're doing it for the first time, they recommend that you go to the GBBC, the Great Backyard Bird Count website, and they've got some helpful birding tips and some birding app downloads. And uh, you can also see on that map that they've got there uh, some different community events. Um, the Great Backyard Bird Count is a joint project of Cornell Bird a Lab of Ornithology, um, National Audubon Society, and Birds Canada. And is actually um, funded in part uh, by a founding sponsor, Wild Birds Unlimited. So Audubon Society Kalamazoo is actually leading two of the GBBC uh, activities this year, one at Wolf Lake Fish Hatchery, the other at Upjohn Park. If you go to kalamazooaudubon.org for information, you can see when, when they're meeting for those. And uh, so, so something interesting with uh, you know, coming up with the birds again, you might see a little more bird activity, uh, especially with the warmer temperatures they're predicting in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So should see a lot more bird activity. Cool. So probably should throw out this. Uh, it's a sort of a, quite a nebulous answer for my trivia question today. So okay. I'm, I'm going to be somewhat lenient, but uh, there's actually quite a few sort of actually correct answers. So we'll see what people come up with. So my question today is, because yesterday was Groundhog Day, why do we look to a groundhog to forecast the weather? <laughs> That's a good question. So why, why, why do we you know, why, look why to Why is the groundhog the guy? Woody the woodchuck or who, you know, there's all sorts of... Uh, Animals out there that they use in different regions of the of the country to predict the weather. So why do we look at groundhogs to predict the weather? Okay. All right. 382-4280. If you haven't won anything in the last 30 days, you or anyone in your household, you are eligible to win. And once again, Gary and I have to remind you, uh, we're the only ones here and I'm the only one with the phone. So <laughs> when you call, I'm going to answer and then put you on hold right away. That does not mean I'm hanging up on you. Just stay put, and we'll get to you as soon as uh, as soon as I can uh, as I can get you off hold. So, uh, so the question again is: Why do we look to a groundhog to forecast the weather? There you go. All right. So uh, we'll wait for some uh, phone calls, and uh, in the meantime, I uh, it does surprise me. Oh, and we have a phone call. Oh, we got a call coming. Yeah. All righty. Okay. So let's uh, see if they stuck around. Good morning. Welcome to Nature Watch. Who's this? Good morning. My name is Gay. Hi, Gay. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing, I'm Gary? A, Gary and I are both upright and breathing. We're good. <laughs> That's exactly right. Us too. All right. So the question is, why do we turn to Senior Groundhog or Senorita? I guess it depends on who it is. Yes. Uh, to tell us what's going on with the weather. Well, I just read a blurb that it was some guy from Germany that brought the groundhog over and started the whole deal. Well, I will accept that. All that's right, actually there the, we go. So it actually was a tradition right. in, in Germany. Yeah. And uh, they actually, uh, in, in Europe, they looked at, at hedgehogs mm -hmm. and badgers. And uh, obviously, there aren't any hedgehogs in Pennsylvania. 
Um, a lot of the Germans settled uh, in Pennsylvania, and they looked at that tradition, and they adopted the, the groundhog to uh, predict the weather. And it sort of goes back to a tradition of uh, Candlemas on yes. the 2nd of, of February, which is the midpoint between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. And there used to be quite a, a celebration uh, on that. And uh, so that, that's why they uh, they look at that time. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more with Candlemas. So it's a tradition that they brought over from Europe. And uh, it, it's interesting. I'll talk about some of the other critters, too, because not everybody looks at groundhogs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's cool. Well, Gay, congratulations. First caller in, and you're uh, you're our winner. So I'm going to put you on hold really quickly. In just a few minutes, I'll be right back with you to get your information. And uh, we will mail your prize, which is, of course, a $20 gift card to Waddell's, uh, to you very soon. Thank you very much. All I right. appreciate that. There you go. Hang on a second, ma'am, and we'll be right back with you. Well, that was quick. <laughs> Son of gun. Yes. Okay. I'm good. I'm good with that. That's, that is good. I'm, are there other reasons that... Well, yeah, actually, I'll, I'll talk. You're going to talk about those? I'll talk about that a little bit okay. here with, with Candlemas and, All right. uh, and that, too. I so. remember Candlemas. I, I learned about that when I was in Germany. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, it was kind of cool. Yeah, it's so. actually quite quite big. Um, the uh, Candlemas actually uh, started back as actually a pagan tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, it was that sort of halfway, between, halfway point between winter solstice and spring equinox. And uh, it actually goes back to some of the Celtic tradition of Imbolc. Uh, which involved lighting candles at the start of February, and it goes back as far as the 10th century A.D. Um, Christian Church actually adopted, uh, expanded the idea and ad- adopted it into the festival of Candlemas, which uh, commemorates the, when the Virgin Mary first took the, the baby Jesus to, to introduce him as, a, as her firstborn. Um, on that feast day of Candlemas, clergy would bless and distribute all the candles needed for winter. And over time, the focus of the day became increasingly about predicting how long or winter it would last. As one English folk song put it, if Candlemas be fair and bright, come winter, have another flight. If Candlemas brings clouds and rain, go winter and come not again. There we go. Okay. So, so that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds about right. So. so all right, it, cool. Uh, so if they, you know, they uh, further expanded it, with, especially in Germany with the hedgehogs and then sometimes badger. Um, if it saw its shadow, there would be a second winter, six or six more weeks of bad weather, according to German lore. All right. And That's... so the German settlers, when they settled in Pennsylvania, brought that tradition over with them. Um, Punxsutawney sort of got a, a unique start. Um, Punxsutawney Groundhog Club was actually a hunting club. It <laughs> uh, was founded in 1886. And one of the members was the editor of the town's newspaper and it per- quickly per- published a proclamation about its local weather prognosticating groundhog though phil didn't get his name until 1961 the first gobbler's knob ceremony took place in 1887 the rest is history and uh, so they still dress up in the garb with the top hats and everything in punxsutawney and make quite a festival out of it uh, it uh, it's actually quite large uh, they get, uh, in years past, I've had like over 38,000 people show up to see Punxsutawney Phil uh, make his prediction. And uh, it's uh, interesting because uh, Punxsutawney Phil, there's been several Phils, um, though officially Phil is 137 years old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Groundhogs don't live that long. And uh, But uh, initially when they had Groundhog Day, they would make the prediction with the groundhog, and the event usually culminated with the weather forecast being forecaster being served and eaten as a main entree. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, I bet. Well, and I'm sure that that's why they volunteered. I'm sure, the groundhogs weren't too happy about that. No, I would imagine not. <laughs> um, Phil was actually um, previously known as Brer Groundhog, and uh, so he uh, makes that makes that prediction with. Uh, with the weather, Phil's official name and title is Punxsutawney Phil, seer of seers, sage of sages, prognosticator of prognosticators, and weather prophet extraordinary. Ah, okay. <laughs> well, that you know, that would make sense, I guess. And so. in the first article in the newspaper, the editor said, uh, claimed that uh, Phil was the only, they didn't name him Phil then, but that their groundhog was the only true weather forecasting groundhog. Ah. <laughs> Well, at least he's unique, you know. Yes, yes. So, all right, well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, Gary's going to talk more about the other critters 
Yes, that yes. happened to uh, also be in this Groundhog Day type thing. So we'll be right back with Nature Watching and our host Gary Miller in just a few moments here on WKZO. Can we ever have too many house plants? Fill your home with beautiful air cleaning plants from Waddell's Nursery Florist and Garden Center. Waddell's has just received a fresh shipment of house plants that will give your home a fresh new look, and right now they're all thirty percent off. Want plants that don't need to be watered very often? Try succulent plants. Want something that can grow in a poorly lit area? Get Pothos plants. Are you looking for an easy care house plant? Then you'll want to check out ZZ plants. ZZ plants are sure to be some of your favorites because they're tough as nails, don't need lots of light, and are easy to grow. Some more beautiful choices that have just arrived include rattlesnake plants, staghorn ferns, Hindu rope plants, palms, and so much more, all 30% off through next Wednesday. To learn more about houseplants, check out today's Green Thumb classes at Waddell's. For more information, go to waddells.com. And remember, your local houseplant headquarters is Waddell's Nursery Florist and Garden Center. All right, WKZO News Time is 8.47, and we're back with Gary Miller, our host of Nature Watch. We're talking about the critters that predict the weather. Predict the weather. Not yes. just Puxatani Phil. Correct. And our friend across the way there. Which yes, is, uh, the... Uh, of the uh, there's, there's quite a few critters around the country that predict the weather. Most of them are groundhogs. Um, of 13 that, that they uh, at least saw, mentioned in an article that I was reading, 10 of them agreed with Phil that we're going to have an early spring. Three of them said, "Oh, wait a minute, we got winter, winter for another six weeks." <laughs> so Staten Island Chuck um, predicted that there's going to be an early spring. Also, uh, according to his handlers. He's accurate more than 80% of the time, dating back to their first festivities at the Staten Island Zoo in 1981. So maybe a little more accurate than Phil. Uh, Friday's prediction, yesterday's prediction, actually uh, marked 10 years since uh, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio dropped Chuck during the Groundhog Ceremony. Ten, that was 10 years ago. The animal That's died so a week later. Oh. And I think he was probably remembering from the year before because the year before the groundhog bit him through his glove and drew blood. There we go. <laughs> so yes. I'd be a little leery too after the groundhog starts squirming. Yeah, you got to wonder. So you know. an, an autopsy um, determined that the groundhog suffered internal injuries, but it wasn't clear if that was from the, the animal getting dropped. Okay. And uh, so after that, they uh, actually have instituted some very special handling conditions and only zoo um, keepers get to handle the, the groundhog. And so they would keep the animal nice and safe. Um, Georgia has a groundhog named General Beauregard Lee. And, of course. Uh, he also <laughs> predicted an early spring this year. Uh, he's also got a better record than Phil, about 70% accuracy okay. so, since right. 1994. Um, Woodstock Willie in Woodstock, Illinois. And that's actually where most of the movie Groundhog Day was filmed, even yes. though it was supposed to be placed in, uh, you know, set in Punxsutawney. And uh, he... Uh, Actually predicted an early spring. Um, an interesting um, longtime WGN chief meteorologist, Tom Skilling, who is just retiring, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken, um, read the groundhog's prognostic- prognostication of an early spring. Um, in Washington, D.C., uh, is Potomac Phil. I guess I had to borrow the Phil name. Um, again, an early spring prediction. Uh, Buckeye Chuck in uh, Marion, Ohio, also predicted an early spring. However, Woody the Woodchuck in Howell, Michigan, yes. predicted... Six more weeks of winter. And she has been more accurate than Phil. Okay. Also. Well, then. Um, so they actually um, take take into account how long Woody comes out of her, her den. And if she stays outside more than 30 seconds, it's spring. So spring's around the corner. It's going to okay. be an early spring. She was out there 20 some seconds yesterday, but mm. uh, she went back in. So they said, no, winter's going to stick around stick for around. another six, six uh, weeks at least. And she's also been accurate nearly 70% of the time. And uh, in uh, Quarryville, Pennsylvania, they have Octorero Orphe. And he also predicted another six weeks of winter. In Connecticut, they decided to get away from the groundhog, so they have scrambled the duck. <laughs> um, I had to, had to chuckle when I saw that. <laughs> Uh, the so the duck looks for his shadow to do the prognosticating on uh, Groundhog Day. This year's shadow wasn't present, a sign of early spring. And according to his handlers, he's been doing this since 2015. He's got a 100% accuracy rate. Wow. So we'll and see. And what did the duck say again? 
Um, early spring. Early spring. So early spring. with with Phil. Okay. Um, in Iowa, um, Polk County, Paula predicted an early spring, and in uh, Boulder, uh, Flat Iron Freddy also predicted an early spring. Now, Flat Iron Freddy is a deceased, stuffed, fur-damaged, yellow-bellied mermit who, with the help of his handlers, always arrives in a surprising ra- way at the Chautauqua Radio- Ranger Station to declare to the world whether or not he sees his shadow. Mm. Um, in Connecticut, Chuckles the Groundhog. In Manchester, another prediction of early spring. Beardsley Bart in Bridgeport, Connecticut, is a prairie dog. And he also predicted an early spring. Big Al the Alligator in Texas. I've heard of Big Al. Uh, he's a 93-year-old, 13-feet, 4-inch long alligator, and he's been predicting uh, also that we'll get an early spring, at least in southeast Texas. And uh, so we'll see uh, see how accurate they are. Um, I guess I'm going to lean more towards Woody. Yeah. yeah. Woody's more local. That's a, we're a, that's a hometown. Yeah. It's a yeah. Home, Woody's a hometown you know, uh, favorite. And so. uh, her accuracy has been, been very good. So. Yes. Yes. Although I'm, I'm wondering about that duck. Yeah. You know, 100%. It'd be kind of hard to prove it was 100%, though, but still. Yeah, I know, I know in uh, Portland, Oregon, they, they have a beaver that predicts the weather. Mm. Um, I think there was another place in Texas they have a frog. <laughs> oh, um, the frog has not been very accurate, I don't think, though. Um, it's hard to believe that frogs would be too active, even down south and as cold as it's Yeah, been. I was going to say. You know, um, aren't they a hybrid? They'd be pretty, pretty lethargic. Yeah. Um, so it... Uh, it's interesting. Uh, some fun facts about it. I actually was reading about the groundhogs on uh, from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, they're also called woodchucks mm-hmm. um, or whistle pigs. Whistle. I've never heard that one. And I've heard that name before. Oh, woodchucks, so they, yeah. So the whistle pig nickname they got because when they're alarmed, they have a high-pitched whistle to warn the colony. So if you've been around, seen any prairie dog colonies, prairie dogs do a similar type of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but groundhogs will do that white, the high-pitched whistle. Uh, they uh, weigh as much as 11 pounds. Um, their teeth grow throughout their lives, so they're that rodent family. And they're also very quick. So when they want to move, they can move very rapidly. They're very good swimmers and also very good tree climbers. That's the woodchuck uh, name. Um, they have two layers of fur, a dense gray undercoat and a longer coat of banded guard hairs that gives the groundhog a frosted appearance. When they're frightened, the t- hairs of the tail stand straight up. And, uh, you know, as we know, they, they live just about everywhere. <laughs> um, they're exceptional diggers and will uh, use their claws to create an intricate system of underground burrows. Um, they also have usually excavate a separate bathroom chamber. Oh, wow. So they actually do their business. And uh, um, actually, one of the, the article was, yes, groundhogs poop underground. <laughs> uh, so, so they actually well, yeah. do their business, which it makes sense if they're down there, yeah, especially in the winter there time. All the time yeah. So, they um, they eat mostly plants, uh, fruits, vegetables, but very little water. So, most of the moisture they get from dew on the leaves or just from the plants themselves. But they also will occasionally eat insects, bird eggs, and other tiny critters. And uh, so, they uh, they actually will go into hibernation. Um, it was actually quite interesting. They um, will lower their temperature when they go into hibernation and they go into deep hibernation to basically the ambient temperature inside their burrows, which is runs about 60, 62 degrees. Okay. And so. they slow their heart rate down to about four beats a second. And they slow their breathing rate down to about two breaths a second. So they really are, are hibernating. Mm-hmm. So that's why Phil always looks a little discombobul- discombobulated when he gets taken out of his burrow, I think. I'm going to have to go look at those pictures again because you said that their tails stand up when they're in, either annoyed or, yes. or whatever. Yeah, the, the hair, I, have the hair to, the tail. I have to look and see if Phil's tail is uh, standing yeah. on it. I don't know if he was all. awake enough to be alarmed. Well, okay. <laughs> that's well, that's true. Um, I still think that that's the job that I don't think anybody really wants is to, okay, who's reaching in there this year? Um, you know. Growing up on a farm and having seen lots of groundhogs, um, they get cornered. They get very, very vicious. So. I was going to say, you know, I don't know. I, I, I imagine he doesn't have like memory. You know, oh, oh they it's might. Groundhog Day again. Crap, <laughs> they're coming after me. Yeah, yeah. You know? so, I'm going to bite him this year. By golly, by gum, I'm going to get him. So now, well, anyway, that's so. That's, I, is, I didn't know there were that many animals that actually did the. Uh, 
for not yeah for I, I, was, I was just surprised there was stuff. that many too and and uh, you know, some of the other animals besides groundhogs um, that was that was actually surprising yeah. to me uh, it, you know it's all that whole thing if they see the shadow or not yeah. and I always had an interesting thought well gosh if a, you know groundhogs typically if it gets warmer the males are coming out looking for a mate that's that's where they see the activity usually if it's warmer out spring is coming around the corner spring's mm-hmm. going to be soon arriving and so the, the groundhogs start getting active. Um, the females also come out at that time. Some of the females, and it depends on the area and the temperature, sometimes the females are active before the males. Um, so they do come out um, looking for that mate. And uh, But I always always had this sort of a funny thought, that, gosh, if we have any kind of daylight, you can if you look closely, you can almost always see your shadow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. And you know, just because they, they don't have a shadow first thing in the morning, if they look later in the day, they see their shadow, or do they confuse to what to predict? Or you know. Well, and you wonder why Phil doesn't see a shadow all the time with all the TV lights around. Well, yes. Yeah, you know, I yeah. mean, come on. Well, and it's always very, very early in the morning and quite yes. dark. So I, yeah. it, it, I think it would be difficult to see a shadow. I think they say, oh, gosh, if the sun's coming up, and Phil can see a shadow. Um, so so when Phil, um, when they do read Phil's proclamation, um they have a special cane that allows one of the members of the Punxsutawney uh, Groundhog Club to speak groundhog ease with Phil. Yes. And Phil indicates which which scroll for them to read. So that's how they de- determine what uh, what his prediction is. Mm-hmm. So, uh, must be a special school to, to I'm guessing. I just uh, have no clue. But, you know, I, I would like to believe Phil, but I'm with you. Woody the Woodchuck, I think, is my... I, I think we're probably... I, I got a feeling we're in for a little more. And what really scares me is like what we were talking about off air, is that a lot of flowers and trees and things like that are going to mistake this warm weather we're going to have next week. And they might start saying, all right, it's time. And then, boom, you know, we get the second blast of, of winter. Yeah, and it's... Uh, I, I think, you know, we've seen years past, especially recent years, it seems like we get that little warm up midwinter about this time, and then we get some really cold yeah. weather again in March and April. And it messes up all and the fruit trees. And I, everything as else. long as uh, we had that really warm fall, as late as it was this year, I, I mean, I'm a little apprehensive too because I think yeah. we're going to probably see a big weather, weather, cold weather blast uh, late and uh, have some really cold weather. Yeah. Before hopefully we have, I'm wrong. Hopefully, uh, I'm wrong. hopefully you're wrong, but you, know, you never. Know. Before we have to go really quickly again, remind us of the activities going on at Woodell's. Yeah, so we've got a couple of seminars today about uh, house plants and succulents. Um, next weekend, we've got uh, two two seminars: one on um, native plants for birds in mm-hmm. your landscape, and using rocks in your landscape. Cool. And uh, I'm actually doing both of those seminars next Saturday. All so right, I got a full go. day next Saturday. So you got a you got a you got. So a... if you happen to be in my rock seminar next Saturday and my voice is starting to go, it's probably because I've been talking for several hours. <laughs> You want to do this again next week? We'll do this again next week. All right. Thanks, Gary. We appreciate it very much. And thank you for listening to Nature Watch. Tune in each and every Saturday after 830 for Nature Watch. Brought to you by Waddell's Nursery Floral Garden and Bird Center at the corner of Middleman 12th Street. We're right there on the roundabout. Next up, CBS News, local news, and then we'll have uh, American Outdoors Radio for you here. On 590, 106.9 FM, don't, WKZO. Don't forget, K-Wings hockey tonight, 635. They're going to try to get some revenge against the Iowa Heartlanders, who they lost 2-1 to last night. And uh, hopefully they will uh, pick up a, a win and start another winning streak. So, uh, again, that's at 635 tonight on 590, 106.9 FM, WKZO.